Hi, this is Burgundy, and you are watching F78 TV. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I love. It. Well, my trip has been so far pretty easy. Uh, getting here is always a breeze because I'm mostly asleep, and being here has been an uh, <laughs> being here has been an amazing experience as usual. So yesterday, my show at Pizza Express Live was amazing. The crowd was very responsive. I like an interactive crowd, and I like to say that at the start of my show. So, you know, I kind of set the standard for how the rest of the show is going to go. And people usually vibe with it because they come out of the house to have a good time. So we ended up um, dancing a lot. I made a lot of the audience dance because at some point I just got tired. <laughs> and it was like a power packed, um, a power packed show. The songs were, uh, were epic and it was a great atmosphere. Pizza Express Live really is a really good venue. We're small. Man. It's small, it's intimate, but at the same time, it was just big enough, you know? I could sit down and everyone can see me. There was a good vantage point. I had a good view of the room. And even when I wanted to get up and move, it was I was able to do so. So I could work a room or I could sit still and work a room. Either way, I worked the room. Okay, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and... I was always around music. My father sang, my mother, my grandmother used to write, my grandfather had a group. Um, I don't know, music has always been my thing. I've always been in chorus and choirs and I was tra classically trained in high school. And once I got out of the military, I decided to sing more. Mm -hmm. And working in different venues, doing a lot of karaoke in Atlanta, doing theater in Atlanta made me move to New York. And I met so many amazing singers and musicians there and ended up somehow here <laughs> and then on X Factor. So everything has been really cool. Well, I came in 2017 to audition for Britain's Got Talent because a, um, a friend I had here had convinced me to do it. And when that didn't quite work out, Right before um, I came back, well, just to um, just to hang out and go to her jam sessions and stuff. So last year, right before I was getting ready to leave, um, the opportunity to do X Factor came. So, so this is my third time here now, and I love that it's always surrounded by music. So it's worth it. No, actually, um, I was invited to audition while I was still here in the UK. And it turned out pretty good, I think. But were you invited or somebody invited you to come and try? I was invited, yeah. All right, okay, wow. I was invited to come and I didn't think it was something I could do. I didn't think it was possible, but it turned out it was. Was that was your first time in the UK? Right? Uh, well, that was my second time. Second time, okay. Because the first time I had come from Britain's Got Talent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you come here to hijack, um, extract a UK like, I didn't even come for X Factor. I was coming here just hanging out. Okay. Oh, wow. That first audition, I can't even begin to explain how exhilarating that was. Well, I guess that was the explanation. It was exhilarating. Um, I never thought I'd ever make it to anybody's television show, even though I tried for years, absolute years. But it just never really got anywhere. And to actually be able to do that and then get the feedback that I got. And the crowd response was so huge. It was electrifying. So it was hands down one of the greatest moments of my life. Um, my biggest moment in the X Factor was the actual audition day when Simon said all those wonderful things about me, um, pursuing my dream and saying that my story wasn't a sob story, it was a hope story, a story of hope and that perseverance and hard work can get you where you want to be. And it just felt really good to hear that from someone who's such a, a staunch critic of so many people. Mm. And to see him smiling and dancing and laughing and knowing that I could create that, that was a great moment for me. Yeah. So with X Factor, I made it to the top 24, which was basically judges' houses. 
I didn't make it to live. Judge's House was last step before lives. Mm. But, you know, maybe I will this year. You're trying this year again? I'm going to try. I'm, if they let me back. If they let me back, I'll so do it. So how many times can you appear? On I have no time idea. Time. I will only do it this one more time if they let me. Just because I want to go to live shows. I really you want, want to. People to see what you got. Right. I really want to showcase. Not just showcase. I really want to push the boundary of what's been accepted as music and mm-hmm. entertainment. And people tend to stereotype it and say it's for this one age group and it's for that age group. And you can't be this if you're not this, this, that, and the other. And I'm trying to push all of that because I'm not letting anybody tell me what I can't do. So how would you describe your style of music? I don't see how you would describe it. My style of music, I would have to say, is powerful. I can't think of a better word than that. Because for one, I express myself. I don't just sing. I express myself. So you get the full impact of who I am as a person and what I love. And so I share my love through music. And it comes back to me tenfold every time. Tried, um, I first started auditioning for the Apollo back in 2009 or 10, 2009. And I never got far, far. I would be maybe second or third place, and then I would never make it to the finals. So it took till 2015 to go through, I think, four or five rounds to finally make it to the finals and actually win. And when I was in the qualifying rounds, I never had first place. Even in the qualifying rounds, I would get second or third. So it didn't look like I would ever get to the finals, let alone get first place. So when it happened, oh, talk about a dream come true. It's very very competitive. And people don't know it, but a lot of um, people, well, a lot of contestants, they'll bust in their friends and family to specifically to boo you. So I got booed a couple times. I can't say a lot, but a couple times I got booed. But it didn't. It wasn't enough to get me put off the show. But it wasn't because I wasn't good. It was because I was good, and they were trying to knock me out of the competition. Dreams, yeah. <laughs> so when I finally won in 2015, it was literally a dream come true because I wanted to do that since I was a child, and. Winning in 2015 really jump-started my life. I can say that for sure. Who are you wearing? The headpiece. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Describe your style. Like, what would you like to wear? Like, um, my style is unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wear things that are comfortable to me, but I don't like getting stuck in comfort. Mm. I like to push the boundaries because I like things that glitter. I like things that are pretty and... I like things that are retro. So I kind of mix the two or three. I just mix them all and see whatever, you know, looks good on my head because since I'm bald, I like to accent that. So, um, I don't know. In 2016, I got sick and I was dying in the hospital. And in the process of my recovery, I lost my kidneys. Mm -hmm. And after my kidneys came back, I had blood clots. So the medicine that we used that to treat that, I think the culmination of all, combination of everything made me develop alopecia. So alopecia is hair loss. <coughs> Excuse me, is hair loss. And the hair in various spots of my head wouldn't grow back. So I had to make a decision, <coughs> excuse me, of spending my life being self-conscious, trying to cover up my hair. By using wigs or braids, you know, I try to cover up these spots or and let it control me because that was the issue. I don't like being controlled, letting it control me or taking control of it. So one day I went and got my hair cut and the beautician refused to shave my hair off, even though I paid for it and I asked for it. <laughs> um, so I went home and stood in the shower got my razor, and shaved it off. Cried, crying the whole time, the whole time, crying, crying, crying. Because, you know, women connect our identity to our hair. Feminism 
to our hair. And the world calls you beautiful because you have hair. And it has to be long, flowing, and whatever. <laughs> and I had grown up in that atmosphere where your hair had to be pretty. So I was sh cutting my hair off and basically chucking all of that out the window. People think you and I look like people are... People still look at me like I'm the weirdest thing on earth. But I had to accept it. And in order to accept, to move on, I had to. So um, I shaved my hair and I shaved my entire head and I got out of the shower and I looked in the mirror and I, I was crying, I was crying, I was crying. I, it took me a while to open my eyes. I opened my eyes and I was like, oh, I look good. <laughs> look at that. Fresh, a, head. fresh head. Apparently all these years, I was hiding behind my own hair. I didn't realize how much I hid behind my hair. And I felt invisible. And now I can't hide from it. And you can't, you can't not see me. <laughs> as far as my family, I've always known this is what I wanted. It was just a matter of being able to do it. Everybody had a part to play. And I never, I never really felt appreciated growing up in what I wanted to do. So I was always taught that there was a bigger world outside of music mm -hmm. and I needed to participate in that world. Mm -hmm. And I did it because I was a dutiful child, but my heart is always, always singing. Yeah, tell us about your, your grandpa, the musician, I did in the band or the singers. Mm -hmm. um, tell, tell us my about grandfather, um, Granddaddy Skeet is what we call him, um, had his own gospel caravan. And they were known throughout the state and they would sing in churches around the state and do carnivals and do all kinds of stuff with their gospel music. And my grandmother, before they broke up, used to write his music. So we had his album, a couple of his albums growing up that I used to listen to that I had no idea was my grandfather. And I remember my one of my youngest memories with my father is going to his rehearsals. So we would go to his band rehearsals and I would sit on his lap or sit on his best friend's lap, which I used to call um, Uncle Larry, and watch them, uh, listen to them sing. And then, because I couldn't help myself, I would join in, and he'd be like, no. I'm like, I'm singing your part. <laughs> you listen to, what do you listen to? Right now, oh, I am heavy rotating, heavily rotating Aretha Franklin, because I've become an Aretha Franklin tribute artist, and she has so much music that it gives me no end of material to learn. So right now, my whole life is Aretha Franklin. Artists nowadays, I have feel no connection to. Their music sometimes make me cringe, mm -hmm. simply because it's embarrassing to me. And it's, it doesn't talk about anything that relates to my life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's great for other people. Maybe they have, you know, mm -hmm. the connection to it. But I just can't connect to it. I was a big Maroon 5 fan. I love Pink. I think she is a phenomenal artist and an amazing woman. And ah, um, Green Day. I like Green Day. And a couple of other bands. So I don't know, my music taste varies, even though I may not perform the music that I love, but I still love a lot of different music. <laughs> life, honey, life comes at you fast. And sometimes you have to switch it up. And I have no problem switching it up. Um, I've, um, sometimes my integrity would let me keep a job. So I would have to quit. And move to the next one. And move to the next one. Um, when I got out of the Army, there was a lot of different opportunities to do things outside of what I was originally trained for. So I would, you know, take you go where the money is. And sometimes... You just have to go where your heart is. And it moved me in a different, lot of different directions. And I had a lot of skills. So I wanted to make sure, I definitely made sure that everything that I could do, I tried mm -hmm. before I gave my life completely to music. Yeah. Now, what's about me singing Get Free, the love song, The Age of Anxiety? Talk to us about that. Okay. So the single Get Free in the Age of Anxiety. It's a love song. It's awesome. Um, my friend Amy, she wrote it, and Asia Rainey wrote it. And I was just 
fortunate enough that they let me sing the sing the hook. And when um when she originally gave me the music, I learned it, but I didn't really think about it. I didn't really I learned it, I listened to it, I'm like, oh I like it. But the moment I had to sing it, I felt it. It got really real. Sound personal. Yeah, it was it became very, very personal because you do have to love like never before. You have to love like this is war because life is war. You're constantly fighting on emotional, physical battles and you just gotta show people love and it does return back to you. So I love that song so much because love really is freeing. I want to bring love back to music. Right now it's not about love. It's about stunting on somebody. It's about fronting somebody. It's about telling somebody else's business. Um, and there's a, I feel like there's a lack of integrity. There's a lack of decency in music nowadays. And I want to bring that back. I don't want to sing about body parts, my body parts, or somebody else's husband, you know. I want to bring love back to music and fun without it being negative. I think what's missing in R&B today is accountability. Our, our music used to bring something to the community. It used to bring love and togetherment. I mean, togetherness and love. It used to bring um, awareness. And now it's vapid. It has no substance. It's all about flash. A lot of people are nowadays repeating songs, singing about things that they have no connection to. We don't have all this money. We don't. We're not running, riding around with jewels and money, clothes and Benzes, and and all these, um, um, all these name brand things. They're useless. It brings no value to your life. It may sound valuable, but it's mm. it really isn't. And I, I want to get back to that. So that's why I'm so stuck in the time when music touched you, mm. not just made you angry. Um, musically, I would say my, <laughs> I my my top five influencers yeah. were of course Aretha Franklin, Stephanie Mills, Patti LaBelle, Whitney Houston. Um, Mariah Carey, I loved her. Yeah, I you mentioned Mary. <laughs> Mary did black. Oh, um, <laughs> Mary wasn't it wasn't so much of an inspiration as she was yeah, a pioneer of your own voice. She was so unique. Mary is so unique um, in her delivery that she just gets so much love and respect from me. Okay, so what's next for me is I completed my, I just finished recording my very first dance track and I am waiting to get music from my friends who are also writers and performers and I'm working on becoming a better writer and recording my own things because I can't keep hiding behind other people's emotions. Mm. So I'm trying to learn how to express my own. So we'll see. Well, femininity. Okay, it was most, not so much as feminism, but femininity. Um, for me, femininity, it, mine is, I define myself as beautiful beyond boundaries. I don't set boundaries for myself as to what is pretty. I just am. So I, I've rejected other people's ideas of what's supposed to be beautiful. And just know that I'm, I already am. I am, I am that. Mm -hmm. And I walk around every day unbothered. So I'll be back in the UK. Um, I'll be back in the UK in December, possibly. Between September and, and December. We are possibly planning a Christmas show right back here. It hasn't been uh, finalized yet, but it's coming. It's definitely coming because... I love this place so much. And the response from last night's show was so epic that I can't not come back. I have cool. to come back. Cool. So how can people reach out to you if you're on social media? Okay. 
the best place to find me is mostly through Instagram or my website. My website is burgundysings.com. It's just, and you spell burgundy, B-U-R-G-A-N-D-Y, sings.com. And my Instagram, you can look up Berg is here. It Berg, which is short for Burgundy. Mm-hmm. It's B U R G I S H E R E. And oh, I have two Instagrams. Long story about how that happened. Well, short story. The Cliff Notes is somehow my original Instagram was was hacked and deleted right when at right when my episode of X Factor aired. So I created a new one. And X Factor worked really, really hard to get my original account restored. So now I have two Instagrams. So you can find me on Berg is here, or you can find me on Williams Burgundy on Instagram. Just give us a little bit of your vocability. You know, really? Yeah, just, There's nothing so, so left. Mind, like... I have nothing. Okay. Okay. A few <laughs> stolen moments is all that we share. You've got your family and they need you there. Though I try to resist being last on your list. But no other man's gonna do. So I'm saving all my love for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I just give you a